interested one. Okay. My name is Art Doler. I work here at Aperture. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a software engineer, and I like to think about a lot of things that are tangentially related to software, uh, soft skills, things about the brain. And one of the things that kind of got me started on this was thinking about motivation, and more specifically, my motivation. So before we get started, a brief disclaimer. Topics in this presentation will involve large-scale sweeping and disruptive policies and methodologies, including but not limited to the following. Compensation, benefits, time tracking, bonuses, flex time, team composition, management structure, hiring, firing, reviews, incentive, tasking, policies, and culture. Detailed discussion and potentially positive commentary by the presenter about any of these topics beyond the scope of a single developer's or an immediate project team should not be of necessarily be taken as suggestion of, agitation for, recommendation for, or demand for the initiation of these policies in the context of your larger team structure or your company as a whole, though the presenter might be happy to have those conversations at a later date. I'm not going to read the rest of it. Uh, it's all actually boilerplate. But my point here is I'm going to be talking about some things that are fairly broad in scope. I'm going to be talking about companies and how they hire people and how they pay people and how they reward people, and more than companies, just culture in general. So this isn't necessarily saying that everybody should run out and try and get your CEO or boss or whatever to set you up as a results-oriented work environment. But I do want to talk about these things and help you kind of feel uh, what I feel about motivation and to hopefully change what you can for the better. A lot of this book is based on, or excuse me, a lot of this presentation is based on this book uh, by Daniel Pink. It's called Drive. You may have heard of Daniel Pink. He's a pretty big pop psych writer for psychology stuff. And so to get started, motivation is really vague. Like the word motivation means to motivate, to move. But what do we mean when we say that? What, what am I even talking about? Well, in the scope of this talk, we're going to be talking about clarifying what motivation even means, what I mean when I say motivation. Discovering why you, the people listening, work the way you do. And then hopefully discovering why other people work the way they do. The other people on your team, the other people in your company, the other people in your clients' companies, or your, uh, the people you're hiring. And then I want to help you figure out how to get you and your team to engage together, to do the best work, and to engage with that work. So the first thing we're going to talk about is kind of an exploration <coughs> of motivation over the history of humanity, really. Then I want to talk about type I and type X, which is what Daniel Pink spends a great deal of his book about. Type I is intrinsic, and type X is extrinsic. And we'll get to that later. And then I want to finish with some practical applications, some things that you can take and hopefully go do at your companies, or at least advocate for or agitate for. So let's pull way back. Where does behavior come from? If you have a motivation, something that makes you do something is the definition of motivation I'm using right here. Your motivation creates your actions. It creates desires and it creates your needs. All of these things are coming out of your motivation. What feeds into that motivation? Well, to some extent, your desires and needs feed back. If you have a desire and a need, that feeds back into your motivation. But let's take a step back. Millions and millions of years ago, and before you walk out of the talk and disgust, this goes really quickly we fly through a bunch of million years, because for a long time, things didn't change. So if we get in our DeLorean and head back, kind of to the age of mammals, where it first starts, about a billion BC, this Motivation 1.0, and Motivation 1.0 is really man operating as an animal, or humans operating as an animal, I should say. Very mechanistic, very basic behavioral things. So you have yourself. And you have what psychologists call drives. In this case, you have a hunger drive. You get hungry periodically, unless you're a replicant. And that hunger produces a behavior, which in this case is eating. Similarly, you have thirst, which causes drinking. You have other biological needs, which cause various not safe for work uh, activities. 
to get it slightly more complex, you have a need for money. That's kind of a second level need, a second level drive that arises from cultural circumstances. But that results in an action too, you going to work. And then you also have a desire, a need, a drive for approval. And depending on who you talk to and how cynical they are, that results in an action, you being nice to other humans. So what happens if you don't do the things? You have these drives pushing you forward and you don't engage in these actions that the drives are supposed to be causing. Well, they used to think that it would make you crazy and that very strange behaviors would result. And if you're familiar with that, you've probably heard of this guy, Sigmund Freud. Back in the early 1900s, Sigmund Freud came up with drive theory, the basis for drive theory. Other important names involved are Adler, Alfred Adler, and Hull, two very big psychologists, three very big psychologists, all out there in the very beginnings of time, not beginnings of time, beginning of, of the psychological uh, profession, rather, thinking about things, maybe not so great, maybe just not paying as much attention as they could have, but trying to come up with reasons why humans acted the way that they did. And drive theory was their best guess, basically, that you have these innate drives. And in the case of someone like Adler, this is a quote from one of his books where he talks about the superiority drive. You may have heard of inferiority complex. That was Alfred Adler. So he's talking about this feeling of inferiority that causes you to then go out and try and be better. That's that overcompensation, that push for compensation to account for your inferior feeling. So that's drive theory. Like that's kind of the basis. It's this weird behavioral thing where humans to an extent almost aren't responsible for their actions. They have these drives that are pushing them instead. So we get in the DeLorean and we fly a little bit further forward. From about the start of human culture, let's say, to about 1950, just to put a fine point on it, we have Motivation 2.0. And Motivation 2.0 is a little more complex. We can't function as nothing more than animals with drives that we're not controlling when we're in a civilization that we're all right next to each other. We have to constrain things for the benefit of others. We have to have other people, hopefully have other people constrain things for the benefit of us. So motivation 2.0 is really humans as machines. Under motivation 2.0, if you have a person and they produce a behavior. So for instance, if your child or your dog even does something you don't like, you can, well, if they do something you do like, you can provide a reward. And if you provide that reward, you get more of the behavior. That's kind of the carrot and the carrot and stick. The other half then is the stick. If you punish that behavior, you get less of it. This is the basics of behaviorism or behaviorist theory. That's B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner is what they call a big pimp in psychology. But around 1940, he started working hard at these theories. But drive theory was not, obviously not adequate. So they started working on these theories that included operant conditioning and folding all of these things that people knew about into this larger scale behaviorism. So Pavlov, you'll recognize his name, he was a behaviorist before they call it behaviorism. Skinner, Marshall Linehan was another one. The consequences of the act affect the probability of it occurring again. That's B.F. Skinner pretty much in a nutshell. So we leave behaviorism and we move on just a little further. And they didn't push it a full ver a version number. It's motivation 2.1. So about the 1950s, we come up with this concept. And if 2.0 was humans as a machine, then 2.1 is really humans as androids, slightly more complicated machines with slightly different needs, but really at the heart of it, still machines. Under motivation 2.1, if you have, say, a worker in a factory, he has base needs. He has a need for pay. He has a need for decent working conditions. He has a need for job security. But then above those things, he has higher level needs, enjoyment, achievement, personal growth, kind of building this pyramid. And I'm using the pyramid very the word pyramid very specifically because 
most of you in the room are probably familiar with this, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. If you took a Psych 101 course ever, I guarantee you came up against it, you just might not remember it. Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs states that you have these physiological needs on the bottom. And at the very top, you have these things called self-actualization. What this does is saying you need these things on the bottom. If you don't have those, you're not even going to try for those things on the top. So our factory worker, if he doesn't have decent pay, he doesn't have decent working conditions, he's not even going to worry about whether he's enjoying his job or not. Because there's no hope of him ever getting it. He's very, his mind is focused then on these basic level of things. So motivation 2.1 is if you're following Edward Deming, and that's Edward Deming because he's awesome, is the system of profound knowledge. That's what he called it. There's a bunch of other names. But especially in this period after World War II, they started doing this research on people and the what causes them to work, what forced them to work, what did they derive out of working, what did they get any benefit. And he and McGregor and Hertzberg, and Hertzberg will come up again, put forward these thoughts. Hertzberg's quote here, if you want him, uh, people to do a good job, give them a good job to do. So, you may have heard the phrase, all models suck, but some models are useful. Well, all of these models suck. Each of them is useful in a context, a specific context, but none of them are very useful in the context of the modern workplace. They all function very well. Motivation 2.0 especially functioned very well for a long period of time. I mean, heck, it got us most of civilization. Carrot and stick works to an extent. It's just that in some situations, it doesn't work the way you'd expect it to. And not only does it not work the way you expect it to, it works in a really detrimental fashion to what you're actually trying to achieve. So here's some examples of why this suck. 1971, a psychologist named Edward Desi does an experiment. With this, this is a Soma cube. Some of you may have heard of it. It's a plastic toy where you, you essentially piece it together. It's like a three-dimensional puzzle. Actually, they had one of these at KCDC last year that made me laugh. He organized an experiment over two days, three days, excuse me, with two groups, a test and a, con a uh, control group. And he arranged this so that the test group on the first day got no reward for completing a puzzle. On the second day, they got a reward per the puzzle they completed, per times they completed this puzzle. On the third day, they got no reward again. And then the control group got no reward across the board. He arranged it this way, that the participants would assemble two configurations. And then Desi would leave to go get a fourth configuration. He had to go punch some numbers into a computer to generate it. Now, he was lying. He didn't leave to get a fourth configuration at all. He went behind a, you know, a privacy mirror. And he secretly watched these people for eight minutes. And he tracked how long did they play with these things? How long did they keep playing with the puzzle after I've left the room? Using that as a gauge, how interested are they in this? How much motivation do they have to keep doing this? And some really shocking things happened. So the blue is the test. On the first day, the test has a slightly higher percentage than the group, or minutes played, rather, than the control group, which is just statistical noise. On the second day, however, as you would expect, when presented with a reward, the test group suddenly shot up. They played with it way longer, because they knew that for every time they solved the puzzle, they were going to continue getting rewards. The control group stays about the same, as you'd expect. And on the third day, that's what's interesting. Suddenly, the test group plummets. Not only are they below where they were on the second day, they're below where they were on the first day. You took away the reward, and suddenly, they're just not interested in this puzzle anymore. Less interested, in fact, than they were at the beginning. Whereas the control group actually went up a little. Strike two, Leper and Green, 1973. Leper and Green decided they were going to do some studies on children, specifically children and artistic talent. So they went to a kindergarten classroom, and they watched the children, which is not creepy at all. But they secretly watched the children and tracked which of them 
actually like to draw? Which of them like to do art activities? And they said, okay, we'll write those children's names down on a list and we'll split them into three groups. The first group, they come in and they just get to do whatever. They track how many minutes they're doing each activity, how many minutes of art activity they're doing. But that's it. The second group comes in and they know that there's going to be someone watching them, but nothing happens. They're just allowed to go about, and again, they're tracked how many minutes they spend on art activities. But at the end of the day, if they spent time generating art, the man who was watching them comes over and gives them a nice big certificate that says, you did art today, essentially. A participation award, basically. They got a nice big fun reward for producing art, but only after the fact. Then the third group, was told up front, if you generate art today, you'll get a certificate. Same certificate as the second group got, but they were told about it up front. And then again, they were allowed to go and do as, you know, whatever they wanted for the day. So we have three groups, one of which is the control group, the first one, one of which is given a reward after the fact, and one of which is told about the reward up front. In psychological terms, the third one is called an if-then, reward. If you do this, then this will happen. Well, excuse me, not in psychological terms, but in the terms of the book, um, Daniel Pink's Drive, he calls that an if-then reward. And then the first one is called a now that reward. Now that you have done this, this other thing happens. Two weeks later, Leper and Green went back to the same classroom and tracked these children and said, okay, two weeks have gone by. How many minutes are they spending on art? And again, you see something interesting. The group that was given an expected reward, that was told up front, if you generate art, then you will be given a reward. Now that they're free to do whatever again, the amount of time they spend on drawing has plummeted versus the control group. And versus, in fact, the unexpected reward, which has actually gone up a little. Third strike, Glucksburg, 1964. Glucksberg was famous for doing a bunch of experiments with candles. He loved this experiment, the functional fixedness experiment. If you have a box of tacks and a candle and some matches on a table next to a wall, and you're told that your job, you walk into this scenario and the psychologist tells you, okay, light the candle and don't get any wax on the table. Okay. Let's do this. So what happens is, is that your brain starts processing this. And the solution to this is actually to dump the tacks out of the box and tack the box to the wall. But it essentially requires the box. And it, what it requires you to do is break through this thing they call functional fixedness. You are fixed on the function of the box as you first encountered it, as a container for tacks, not as a potential platform or as a potential container for anything else. So. Glucksberg set up this experiment, and he set it up so that the control group got no reward if they solved it. Pretty standard. On the other hand, for the test group, and keep in mind this is 1964, $20 for the best five times if you're in the top five. And it's, or excuse me, $20 for the best time and $5 for the best uh, top five. 25%, I can't math today, sorry. And again, you see something interesting. The amount of time it took, the people who were paid to solve this puzzle skyrocketed versus the control group. Being paid money to solve this puzzle actually made them solve it less well than the people who weren't being given anything. So compare that to motivation 2.0, the carrot and stick, which would say, if you give somebody money, they should do it better, right? I'm expecting more performance, better performance out of that because they have an incentive. Not so. We've just seen three experiments that say that's not so. Incentive does not always equal the behavior you want. Humans aren't even just irrational. They're predictably irrational. You can predict this, this response across the board. Glucksberg, interestingly enough, did a second experiment where he did the same thing. Except this time, the tax were already out of the box. It's a lot simpler. 
to do this. It's a lot more straightforward. And in fact, it's almost a direct path from there to the solution. So obviously the solution is the same, but the control group gets no reward. And again, $20 for the best time and $5 for the best 25% time. In that measurement, suddenly payment worked. Motivation worked. Okay, so that starts to get a little weird. We didn't change much, we just dumped some tax out of a box and things are different. So let's talk for a minute about tasks. You can kind of break this down into tasks, two types. First being algorithmic. Algorithmic tasks are structured, they're constrained, they're repetitive, they're designed, they're quote unquote solvable. They're algorithms. Heuristic tasks, on the other hand, are unstructured, open-ended, creative, they evolve, they're unsolvable in the computer science sense. You can't solve them by just sitting down and following a list of rules. You have to think a little laterally, you have to think a little outside the box, so to speak, like a lot of people like to say. So what was happening in the Glucksberg experiments was he initially created a heuristic task, something that required you to break through, something that required you to think a little differently, to change your mode of thinking. And then in the second experiment, he actually had an algorithmic task. And in the algorithmic task, suddenly the motivator works. So again, we go back to the models aren't always as great as we want them to be. So a quick question first, what is work? That's not a problem people have been trying to solve for a while. A lot of people say work is worship. <laughs> you can Google it, it's true. I believe it. If you believe Frederick Winslow Taylor, who is a man who is steeped into the carrot and stick of motivation 2.0, work consists of simple, not interesting tasks. The only way to get people to do them is to incentivize them properly and monitor them carefully. How many of you worked in a workplace like this? Yeah, it takes a bit to admit to it. But <laughs> On the other hand, here is Tom Sawyer from good old Samuel Clemens. His take on work. Work cons consists of whatever a body is obliged to do and play consists of whatever you're not obliged to do. Under that theory, how many of you like working at home? Or coding at home, I should say. You're paid to code, probably. I don't know specifically, but the odds are high. So is it fun at home? It's fun coding at home, right? It's fun working on your projects. It's not always so fun working for when it's paid. So that's interesting. And it leads me to this question. Do humans fundamentally dislike this work? Things that we're forced to do? So, another digression, slight digression. This is a book called Man the Game Player. Well, translated as Man the Game Player. It was the book that first put forward game theory. Game theory states that humans function in things, or you can treat humans functioning in things as a game. That's where we get things, terms like zero-sum game, where the party that wins is actually taking things from the party that loses. It's an interesting way to think about human dynamics and human interactions. But if we think about motivation 2.0 in a game theory context, let's think of it like this. You have a maze. Every day you're required to get through this maze. And the maze could be any number of things. It could be tickets you're going through. It could be requirements that you have to generate. It could be TPS reports for all I know. But you're the little rat, the mouse, up here in the corner. And down at the bottom left corner, bottom right corner, is $500. Or whatever quota you have to meet that month. Or your employee of the month certificate. Or whatever. All the incentives, all of these motiv ins motivizers that people push on you, all of these carrot and sticks, that's what's at the end of this maze. But human beings are game players. Human beings think of things and we look at systems and we figure out how to beat them. And I guarantee you that a bunch of you have done this. Right? You just go around it. 
you find some way to get around it because there's something between you and your goal and your job is to get from here to there and you do it the most efficient way possible. And if that happens to ignore a bunch of rules, now, sometimes it's harder to do that. But in a lot of cases, we cut corners because we know that we're pushing for these rules or pushing against these rules that are trying to prevent us from getting to the goal. So, again, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So I've talked a little bit, no, I've talked a lot, rather, about motivation and how it's this weird space that we're entering into where incentives or incentivizers don't work the way we expect them to in some cases. So what is the new model? What am I saying, what am, am I and Daniel Pink saying is kind of this new model? And Pink really puts it forward as motivation 3.0. It's a new way of thinking about motivation, about what motivates us. And if motivation 2.1 was humans as androids, motivation 3.0 is really humans as humans, or we hope it is anyway. It's definitely a lot closer. <laughs> so under motivation 3.0, you have somebody who's doing a creative task, a heuristic task like we talked about. Or excuse me, if they're doing an algorithmic behavior, you can provide this extrinsic stimuli. And an extrinsic stimuli means a stimulus that is coming from outside of the activity. So $500 for completing this really simple task. That's an extrinsic stimulus. Or finish this, you know, or you're, finish your homework or you're not going to bed, or not going to bed with dinner. You're going to skip your dessert if you don't finish your homework. That's an extrinsic stimulus. If you provide an extrinsic stimuli to a heuristic behavior, you get predictable change. That's the first part of this theory. But then, if you have these heuristic behaviors and you apply an extrinsic stimuli to them, you get not what you expect. You actually get less worse of the behavior most of the time. Which is not what you want. Ideally, you, well, ideally you want to provide that heuristic behavior. But if, you're, if someone's providing a, doing an, a heuristic task and you're providing an extrinsic stimulus, you're going to damage their likeliness, likelihood to perform that later. On the other hand, if you provide an intrinsic stimuli, or the task itself provides an intrinsic stimuli, and an intrinsic stimuli is di differentiated from an extrinsic one by being part of the task. So for the people who enjoy coding at home, do you enjoy coding at home because it is therapeutic? Do you enjoy because you like seeing things come together? There are a lot of things about programming that you enjoy, right? Ideally. Otherwise, I'm very sad about your hobby that you don't like. But the, the thought process here is that there are these things about these tasks that you're doing that you actually find enjoyable. And even for people who don't code at home, if you're coding at work, maybe shockingly you find yourself enjoying it sometimes. And so if you provide these intrinsic stimuli, that's when you get more or better of the behavior. That's when you get people who are engaged in the work that they're actually doing. So, summing up, if you have extrinsic motivators applied to heuristic tasks, you get increased short-term performance mostly. In the very short term, you will see an increase in performance. And decreased long-term performance even if you continue providing the reward. The larger the reward, the greater the effects of this. They've actually done a study in India where it was easier for them to get large monetary amounts. And they did tests on things across the board from racquetball to complex logic problems, physical things to mental things, and it didn't matter. The more they were paying these people, the worse they performed. Extrinsic motivators applied to heuristic tasks cloud your judgment. They focus and narrow what you're doing and cause you to think myopically. They make you latch onto a solution and stick with it even if it's not the right solution because you want to get to that reward as quickly as you can, even if it isn't the right way, even if backing up and going a different way would be better in the long run. And they narrow both the depth and the breadth of your problem solving. It gets you this laser focus on the reward and nothing else. 
So Daniel Pink breaks it down into two types of people. It's always two types of people. But he breaks them down into type I and type X, where type I functions under motivation 3.0. Type I are both born and made. You can be born a type I, or you can become one through learning things about yourself or just through exposure to other type I people. Type I people tend to perform best in the long run. They tend to perform better over time spans that are longer, that allow them to make failures and get better at their tasks. Type I are a, new, a renewable resource too, because you don't have to keep throwing carrots and sticks at them to get them to do anything. Money for these people is a hygiene factor. And what I mean by hygiene factor is it's that thing we talked about at the bottom of the pyramid. These things that you need in order to start thinking above that in, in the higher levels of the pyramid. So money for a type I individual, it's just a problem if it's not there. They tend to be internally focused. That's a bit of a stereotype, but it's a little true. They tend to think more about themselves and what they can do than about other people. Type X, on the other hand, tend to focus on or function under motivation 2.0. They're also both born and made. You can be born type X, but you can also be made type X. It happens really quickly if you have a job that doesn't pay attention to how much you work or how much effort you're sinking in and rewards everybody equally. That's a real quick way to get people that are type X because they realize that putting extra effort in doesn't matter. They tend to perform best in the short run over time spans that are short, task things that are short. And they're an exhaustible resource because eventually they're going to either become inured to the amount of resources that you are handing them or they're going to get bored and wander away. For these people, money is generally the end goal. And they tend to be pretty externally focused. So I want to break down type I a little more. Daniel Pink breaks it into three things. Autonomy. Type I people are self-directed. Mastery. Type I people are devoted to self-improvement. And purpose. Type I people are connected to a larger goal. Or they want to be all of these three things. So let's go through these three things. Three things. Autonomy. I control that which I'm responsible for. This is Desi again, talking about autonomous motivation with regards to intrinsic motivation. Autonomous motivation involves behaving with a full sense of volition and choice, whereas controlled motivation involves behaving with the experience of pressure and demand that comes from forces perceived to be external to the self. That's motivation 3.0 and 2.0 in a nutshell, right there. Intrinsic things are these things he's talking about, behaving with that full volition and choice. These things are coming from inside you, from inside the task. On the other hand, motivation, controlled motivation are these external forces, the carrots and sticks. He breaks autonomy down further into the four T's. And he says you need to have control over four things, these four T's. Your task, what you're doing. You need to be in charge of what you're doing, picking your task. Your time, you need to be in control of when you work. Not just how long you're working, but when, what the hours are, whether that's at home, et cetera. Your technique, you need to be in charge of how you're solving those problems of how you're doing your work. And then your team, which is something that a lot of places, even fairly progressive ones, don't really think about. You need to be in control of your team, or at least have an avenue of control into it. You need to be able to say who you work with. Because if you don't, then you start to have problems with autonomy, with not having full autonomy, rather. 3M chairman, William McKnight, back in the day, said hire good people and leave them alone. He's pretty much talking about type I people right there. He's talking about these people that are autonomous, that are directed, that take their stuff and they know what to do with it. They know how to dr or drive themselves. They know how to make themselves do things and push forward. Mastery, the second part of type I people. Mastery is pretty simple. I strive to explore, I strive to become better. The reason 
that people really love mastery and they don't know they do is because it, uh, mastery and engagement are really kind of cyclical. If you are engaged in something, you have a drive to push forward and become better at mastering it. If you master something, you tend to be more engaged in the activity because you know you're good at it. You feel good. You know the right ways to do things. You can feel accomplished and powerful while you're doing that thing. So autotelic experiences is a phrase from a psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, um, who is the man who also developed the concept of flow, which I'll talk about in a minute. But an autotelic experience is one where it is a self-directed experience, self-goal. Literally, he just slammed the words together. An autotelic experience is you pushing yourself forward, driving yourself forward, attempting to gain mastery, attempting to push forward, and you're building these experiences and these goals from yourself. You're setting the goal, not the boss. Your boss isn't saying, go spend 20 hours at home learning this new programming language because you think Go is really cool, or you know, go learn how to set up a web server on a Rust stack. Your boss isn't saying that because your boss doesn't know what Rust is. But you're doing it at home because it's fun, it's interesting. These are goals that you're setting up for yourself. Pink breaks down three laws of mastery. The first one is mastery is a mindset. Diving back into psychology for one quick second, there's this thing called entity theory. Entity theory states that intelligence is a fixed trait, and most things are fixed traits. Therefore, if you feel like you're exerting yourself when you're using your brain, that means that you're hitting your personal limit. You are no smarter than that. And in fact, if you try and choose harder goals, you could fail, which means that you're not intelligent. So that's bad too. So what ends up happening is that you give up on these unsolvable problems. And worse, you don't even try. You look at these problems that are hard and you all take the easier problem because then I know I'll succeed. If I fail on a hard problem, that means I'm not smart. On the other hand, you have incremental theory. And incremental theory says that intelligence is trainable. So broadly speaking, you can pump weights with your brain. But if you think about intelligence as trainable, that means that when you are exerting yourself, that actually means you're improving. It's just like lifting. It's you're feeling it or you're exercising, any kind of exercise, it hurts. That means you're building it. Choosing harder goals actually improves your mastery. If I pick something hard, I know that when I overcome that, when I overcome that, I'm gonna be better than I was now. And last, an unsolvable problem becomes a benchmark. If I had a problem I can't solve, I can go, oh, I'm gonna put that aside, and I know I'm gonna come back to that and kick its ass later. Because I know I'll be better next time I come back to this. So, when Pink says that mastery is a mindset, he means this. He means that you need to think of your intelligence and your skills as incremental, as trainable. Because if you think of them as fixed, you're never gonna push yourself. You will never push yourself toward mastery, and which means you'll never hit it. Mastery is a pain is the second one. And this one is also, this one's fairly self-explanatory. But I love this quote from Julius Irving, being a professional is doing the things you don't wanna, or doing the things you love to do on the days you don't feel like doing them. Coming in and doing code anyway, even though it was snowing and it was really hard to get to work and you almost had an accident and it was terrible, but you come in and you code anyway because you love to do it. That pain is what is kind of a signifier of mastery. It's that no, or field of pain, right? No, no pain, no gain. That pain is the signifier of mastery growing, but you do have to feel that pain. It is painful. It involves failing. It involves trying again. The last thing he says is that mastery is an asymptote. And if you don't remember from math class what an asymptote is, it's this thing where you have the curve where it goes up and it never quite reaches that actual fixed integer, never reaches that final point, it has a limit that it never hits, even if you go out to infinity. It gets real, real close. But you will never be a perfect master. Nobody ever will, especially in software, because it keeps changing all the time, right? There's always something new to learn. There's always something you could be better at. And so you kind of have to resign yourself to 
knowing that even as good as you are, you can always be better, which in some ways, in a lot of ways, is really good. You can always be better at the thing that you'd like to do. The, I mentioned flow when I mentioned Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, which is still a name I love. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow is this experience where you're losing track of time, you're sinking yourself in an activity, and you're so focused on it that time vanishes, your concept of self, a personal self kind of vanishes. You're just, there's nothing there between you and the task. You're doing things and working, and code just falls out of your fingers. So if you've ever had that experience where it's like you've been coding and four hours have gone by and it feels like 10 minutes and you look and there's 400 new files, that's a flow. So these flow experiences are really important for mastery because first off, flow is actually really enjoyable for humans. We enjoy this state, even though we're not really conscious of being in it. It's kind of meditative, it's kind of recuperative and it's enjoyable. So it's one of the counterbalances to the pains of mastery. It's one of the nice things we get alongside of the pain. That's why it, partially why it's important. And the other part is because it does push you forward. Flow generally requires you to be working on a task that's just a little bit harder than your current skill set. So you're pushing yourself forward. And so engaging in flow pushes you forward and pushes your skill set forward and pushes you further toward mastery. The last thing about type I is purpose. And this is something that I think gets misunderstood. A lot of people try it and don't necessarily hit the mark. But when he says purpose, type I people want their work to serve something that matters. I don't want to be writing TPS reports. I, don't be, I definitely don't want to be writing the program that generates TPS reports or consumes them and turns them into spreadsheets so that they can be imported into another program so that they can be screenshotted and dumped into a PowerPoint slide. And if I've just described your job, I'm really sorry. But I don't want to be doing that because that's boring and it's awful and nobody cares, like nobody in the entire chain cares about any of that. They're just doing it because they feel like they have to. It feels like you don't have a purpose, like your job is just useless. Purpose provides a context for mastery and autonomy. Purpose provides you an ability to structure what you're doing and structure you're getting better at that. Purpose is your why behind this job. Why am I going to this job? Why am I doing this? Hopefully it's because it helps people. Hopefully it's because your software helps people do things, learn things, get better themselves. And so purpose-oriented goals wind up being way better for type I people than money-oriented goals. If you want to really motivate somebody who's type I, you give them a purpose. You say, this is going to help little old ladies cross the street. I'm not sure how that would work. It's software, but that's the kind of thing you need to be pushing for. This is going to help somebody with their day, with their life, with something that they have a problem with. And if you can provide those purposes for people, they will motivate themselves way better than you could ever do with a employee of the month plaque. So we talked about quite a bit of things. We talked about type I and type X. We talked about the components of type I. We talked about the motivation. What do you do with all of that? How do you take that back to anything that's useful? So the first thing you have to do is kind of beware imitators. You need to beware of people who are doing things that sound like this that aren't. If you hear anybody use this phrase in a serious manner, with the exception of Nick Tuck, who works here. He's the only person I've seen use it, non-ironically. But anybody else who's using this, you should run away from. Because they generally intend to do you harm. Empowerment is used by management to almost, it's, it's a, a phrase that they use, and it's like they're dribbling out authority to you in this slight, tiny bit. We're empowering you to do this, like they have all of it, and you should be happy that you got any of it at all. That's nonsense. I mean, go back to Uncle Bob, you've got the rights of developers, right? You have rights, you have a stake in the things you're working in. You have a purpose, hopefully, for the things you're working on. And you should be able to push forward for that purpose. And anybody who's stopping you from doing that is getting between you 
and being good at your job and enjoying your job. The Oz principle, which will make Gabe Cook laugh. This is a, com a company in town uses this, and I won't name names, but this book, the book is hysterical because it reads almost exactly like Daniel Pink's Drive and then just stops right before it does anything useful. It involves all of these complicated things for a, you know, keeping responsibility and picking up responsibility between teams and then not actually doing anything with it. People who overfocus on the team, those are other people you need to be afraid of. People who focus on the team over everything and constantly focus on the team is doing this and the team is going to be doing that. And those people can be useful. Like the team is obviously a useful thing. You have a team, hopefully you like your team, but your team is not a monolith. Your team is composed of humans, hopefully. And each of those humans have their own drives, their own reasons to do things, their own reasons to push things forward. And treating everything like a singular team is going to do nothing but lump people into categories where they're not going to feel comfortable and they're not going to feel like they have control over anything. So if you leave those aside, I want to ask two questions. Are you type I? You don't have to actually answer it, but next question is, do you want to be? Because you don't have to be. Type I people are a blast to work with. They're fun. I enjoy them. I love working with them. I, love to, I like to feel I am one. But they're not everything. Type I is not everything in the world. Somebody's got to be working at COBOL, or, you know, like COBOL stuff, doing old reports. I don't know, and maybe they are type I too. Maybe they enjoy that. More power to them. But you don't have to be type I. You can be type X. You can say, I'm going to do my job and I'm doing my job. My passion is something else. It's not really related to my job. I would say that you can still kind of pull things from type I and think about yourself in a little different scenario. But if all you come to your job for is to get paid and to go home, first off, I'd question why you're here, because that seems unlikely. But second off, that's okay. It's okay to get your money and go home. I'm sure it's not unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that a lot of Nate's talk kind of crosses over with the type I talk into a sense that the professionalism that he is describing, I would ascribe to people who are a little more type I than people who are type X. So, you're at Aventure, and I like to feel that we hire people who are a lot of type I. We kind of hire for passion, and we hire for drive. I think those are code words for type I that we're using. And you'll see a lot of places that are kind of startup y feeling, kind of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley esque, hire for these kind of things, hire for culture, hire for feel. In a lot of ways, they're hiring for drive, and they just don't know it. They're hiring for type I people. So, Back to how do we do anything with this? How do we promote type I at our workplaces? Well, first off, type I is contagious. This is really good news because it makes turning your team into type I actually a lot easier. Type I is contagious. If you work with somebody who is type I, who pushes themselves, who knows what they're doing, who demands a purpose, who pushes themselves for mastery and demands autonomy in their work. You can learn a lot from those people. And I, I know I had, was lucky enough to do that early in my career. I think that's partially one of the reasons I feel like I'm type I. So I had somebody to kind of look at and go, oh, there's more to this than just typing, you know, for eight hours a day and then going home. In general, the first thing you need to be doing is to use now that rewards instead of if then rewards, if you use rewards at all. If you take nothing else from this talk, do this or push for this. Because the fastest way to kill somebody's type I is to give them if then rewards. And it's not going to be their fault. That's just how your brain works. You presented them with the reward, you started tying it to different things, and it all falls apart. 
Don't frame traditions or benefits as rewards. If your team likes to order pizza for the sprint retrospective, do not cache it as we met all the goals for the sprint pizza. It's just we like pizza pizza. Because if you start giving it as a benefit or as a reward, it starts to become an extrinsic motivator. People feel like, oh, I have to do this because I know that I'll get pizza. I won't get pizza if I don't ship this bug. That's a problem because now they're going to rush for it. They're going to push to get this bug done and maybe not do as well a job as they could. Avoid using policies or quotas to deal with problems, especially problem employees. There is a study that this was done on a, or excuse me, a thought experiment rather. Um, say for instance, you work at some place that, like the uh, Omaha Housing Authority, some place where you help people on a daily basis and your efforts hopefully make people's lives better. And you go out of your way to help people, uh, kind of go above and beyond because you want to help people. You have a drive to help people, hopefully. You hope, I mean, that these people that you were helping on the phone have better lives. But you have a coworker, and this coworker mails it in. Just every day, does as little as possible to help people and spend as little time as he can on the phone. So your boss decides in his infinite wisdom, like a lot of companies do, well, I don't want to just deal with this one person. I'm going to put a quota into place. And now suddenly everybody has to spend a certain amount of time on the phone with these people. If you do that, the second that happens, you will watch everybody else who is up, up way above the quota. Like your times were way above the quota. You were helping people, you were trying. The second you set a goal, everyone will normalize on it. Even if most of the people you were trying to help were above. So don't deal with quotas and policies to deal with problem individuals like that because you will literally drag your entire team's performance down. Offer real feedback alongside praise. And if you're interested in feedback, I have two one-hour talks now on feedback. <laughs> um, provide real feedback to your employees or people on your team or anybody. Actually give them things that will help. Make your teams no competition zones. And this is really important. Don't force your teammates to com com uh, com compete with each other or compete with other teams because that's a real quick way to start comparing people and making people feel bad. And the second you do that, people start sliding back into type X. Like I know that you know, Matt will work 10 hours a week more than he has to because he likes working and he likes working on the problems he's doing and he doesn't care about home life balance, no. Um, but he, I mean, he'll work extra hours. You really need to have a team where I don't feel bad because I'm not putting in as many hours. Because the second you do that, I start going, well, why am I putting in anything extra? Why am I even trying? And again, you see that regression back to this kind of mean. Encourage peer-to-peer -peer feedback. Try and get people to communicate back and forth with each other and actually talk to each other on your team. Um, oh, that one should have gone out. But so at Aventure, we do a weekly meeting. Well, every two weeks now. And we do shout outs from teams. They're kind of, they were kind of on the spot. And I was pushing to have them actually gathered beforehand. Try and get shout outs from other peer members, other team members. Um, there's this concept called spot rewards, which I've seen a couple of different places where you can actually give rewards out on the spot for people who do things to help you. So it's peer-to-peer -peer rewards. So it's not going up and back down the chain. It has to be direct from peer-to-peer. -peer. Like, you did awesome, here's a, sco a soda. Things like that are really good ways to kind of help and motivate type I in the general case. In the case of hiring, firing, and measuring your employees, try things like the Zappos two-week trial. And I'm not sure if they even still do this since they were acquired, but Zappos used to do a two-week trial. After you were hired, you had two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, they would offer you a cash settlement if you walked. Like, if you want to leave now, you can, and we will give you this money, which is fantastic. That's a, a brilliant way to get type X people to leave if you are trying to promote an entirely type I company, because those type X people will look at the money and, yeah, 
okay. The type I people, hopefully, won't care about that. They'll want to work at the company you have. They'll want to work at the place that cares about them and understands that they need autonomy and they need to push for mastery and they need this purpose. Pay more than average. Again, we go back to money as a hygiene factor. If you want to attract the talent, you have to pay more than average. You have to pay enough that money stops being an issue, that money is off the table. Because if your developers or the people you have doing creative things are worrying about money all the time, they're not going to be thinking about their heuristic tasks well enough. Uh, ensure that your compensation is both internally and externally fair, that you're paying you know, at least the rate for what the local area is and make sure that you're paying the same for the same job. That one should be pretty easy to understand. Try and form diverse teams so that you get different backgrounds, different experiences between your teams. That will help people expose themselves to different viewpoints and hopefully increase their mastery. If you have to use performance metrics, if you feel like you absolutely must for whatever reason, use performance metrics that are wide ranging. Do not focus on any one specific thing Otherwise, you're going to get the classic Dilbert, I'm going to code myself a mini minivan. Where uh, if you haven't seen the comic, they set a bounty for bugs where you get paid if, for every bug you close, which, you know, 30 seconds of thinking will take you through the fallacies in that. But Wally's response is great, I'm going to go code myself a minivan. Don't use metrics that are easy to game. Don't use metrics that are specific and local because what will happen is people will focus on those specific local metrics and ignore the things that you're not testing. Try and make them relevant, make them actually matter. Don't test stupid things like time to live for bugs necessarily. And again, make them hard to game. Make them so you can use these things and not, that you don't, your employees are gonna try and game these things. That's just how it works. Make it so that these things are hard to game. And then if you have a team that has these multiple employees or different types of employees, both type I and type X, make sure you know who's who, which type is which type, because if you try, like the motivation is just not gonna work for one that will work for the other. Daniel Pink talks in the book about how you, mixing type X and type I can be dangerous because you can wind up in a situation where you can start comparing yourselves against each other, where the type X feels like they're not, um, they feel like they're not valued because they don't put in the hours, and the type I feels like they're not valued because they put in more than the other people. That's difficult, and Daniel Pink doesn't actually talk about it in his book. So I'm not sure how to solve this problem, and I wish I could, believe me. But mi just know that mixing these two groups can be dangerous, and that it can be a problem because you can actually have, you can, again, you can turn your type I people into type X by mixing them with a bunch of people who don't care. So if you're committing to type I, you have to be prepared to let people go. You have to be prepared to actually fire people. Because... You, you, you tell them they become type I or else, or you just fire them? That's a good question. And I recommend taking that up with your HR. No. Um, I don't have a good answer to that question. If they were likely to read the book and think about it and attempt to convert themselves, then I think they would probably already be type I. But really? okay. that's a guess. Okay. But the, well, ideally your culture is such that you have other type I people there. They can see what other people are like and they're just not catching on or not wanting to, to catch on. So that would be more of my response is that Hopefully your culture is such that everyone else is type I and can help out and go, hey, you know, this is, or not, rather lead by example, is more what I'm saying. As far as things you can do for autonomy, uh, you can try implementing a results, or results only work environment, a row, and these things are really cool. Uh, nobody tracks hours. You just come in, get your stuff done, leave whenever, do whatever. As long as you get the results done, that's all that matters. Obviously in some companies that's easier to achieve than others, especially ones that care about things like billing hours. But try and institute paid time for uh, 
non-commissioned work if you can. It's a great thing for autonomy. Google time, hackathons or FedEx days, days when you have to ship something in 24 hours, that's a FedEx day. Company offsites, grouplets, letting people splinter off and going, oh, well, we're, the three of us are just gonna go work on this problem for a day or two. You can run an anonymous autonomy audit, and there's an example of this online. Practice relinquishing control. I mean, if you're a manager or a team manager, take a step back and maybe let your team do it for a day or two. Like, practice giving control to your team. Just let go, you know, finger by finger, like a Looney Tunes cartoon. But eventually, if you can let go entirely, I guarantee you, your team will probably shock you. And you can do this by involving your team in goal setting, using non-controlling language, things like don't say must, or we have to, or you know, there thing, you can use language like we should, or we might, or we could do things this way. Um, have office hours, especially if you do run a team. Have hours when you set yourself up and you're like, you can come to me with anything during these hours. That's good for you too, because then you have a period where you know that you're gonna be interrupted and you're not gonna necessarily want to go heads down into anything. Try and allow your team a uh, selection of project that they're working on or at least the task that they're working on. Mastery, things you can do for mastery. Find and use your team's Goldilocks zones. This is a phrase that Daniel Pink uses in the book to describe zones where it's just a little harder than their skill set. Where these tasks are just a little harder than they know how to do. So they're going to have to push themselves to get, get there. So they're going to have to push themselves forward. Trying to give them things to help them grow, to give their personal growth. Drive out fear from your team, especially fear of failure. Do not punish failure in your team with fear or cause fear of failure in your team. That's the quickest way to just have everybody suddenly not care about innovation or care about creativity or care about mastery because they won't be pushing themselves. They're gonna stick with what's safe. Make your feedback emphasize effort, not just talent. It's not, oh, you're so awesome at this. It's, you worked really hard. This one was really cool for kids, or really important for children, rather. And then allow people to progress at their own pace. Don't force mastery on somebody faster just because their coworker is going faster. Some people learn slower. Some people don't have the time due to personal reasons to, to spend as much time in external activities of that. If somebody gets bored on your team, try having them mentor somebody else into their role. Take somebody who's lower and help them teach. Have your coworkers, your, your worker, teach this person their role and then have them train up into somebody else's role to take on more challenging tasks. And remember that secondary skills matter too. And this is something that I found interesting. If, uh, I'm pretty sure that it was Nate Taylor saying, if you work in software and you come in for an interview and he asks you what your hobbies are and you basically don't have any other than programming, he really doesn't want to work with you. And I firmly agree with that actually. If you don't have any hobbies, or secondary things that you're looking into, or things that you like or care about that aren't just code, I'm actually kind of scared of you. So the secondary skills of people matter. It isn't just how good they are at coding, it's how good they are at coding. Oh, and also they do these other things. And that's not just for subject matter purposes for various projects, it's also because that makes them better rounded and it gives them experiences that they can draw into their programming into their software. And then the last one, purpose. Things you can do for purpose. Know your story. Know your story as a company and know your story as a project especially. Know why your project exists and what its story is. And it, the story is not just, well, it's another Facebook. Well, what does it do? What does it help people do? What's the point of it? Why does it exist? That's the story. And ideally, if you have really good business people, they've already done that. They just have to communicate it to you. Make sure everybody knows it. Make sure the biz dev people know it as well as you do. And then allow people to find their own purposes on the team to kind of go, okay, 
well, my purpose is to take this back and I'm gonna go be interested in this part of it over here. You know, allow your team to kind of segment and fragment out as it wants. Try and find a balance for your company between purpose-driven and profit-driven. Try and find a balance between things that are profit-driven, which you have to do because we exist in that economy, and things that are purpose-driven, things that are interesting for your company or that push your company's story forward. And like I said, animate with purpose. Don't motivate with rewards. Get everybody jazzed by giving them that purpose and then giving them the leash to go find, he's like, you animate them with the purpose, you give them the leash of autonomy and let them go at mastery. And they will do amazing things for you. And do good things, that's really number one. If you have a company that does good things, interesting things, valuable things, things that help people, your employees will find that purpose even if you don't necessarily tell them automatically. So, Slightly long on time, sorry. So major takeaways. Again, if you think of nothing else in this talk, use this. Don't use if then rewards, use now then rewards. If you use rewards at all. Avoid using policies to motivate. Use frequent real feedback instead of simple praise. Identify you and your team's types, whether you're type I or type X. And then use the three components of type I to motivate those people. And then motivate type X people with algorithmic tasks with rewards or punishments as necessary. Let type X people convert to your team, convert to type I at their own pace. Have a concrete purpose in what you're doing, whether it's your company or your project, and allow for as much autonomy as you can feasibly manage in your team or on your company. And then attempt to build a culture of mastery, even if it's just a tiny one within your team. Or orthogonal, if you don't, like, if you're working with a couple people from other teams, do something innovative like startup lightning talks. And then aim for diverse teams and try and invoke cross-training between those teams. Okay, any questions? Have you ever done an autonomy audit? I have not done an autonomy audit here. I would be interesting to try. Because it's the... You get the, the reason for that is that it's a, uh, it has to be anonymous, right? Because you need the people to actually speak the truth to power. So it would be interesting to see what would happen. So I just want to see if your answer changes, because last time you gave this, I asked this question. Uh, you said, uh, use now that instead of if then, and you do now that enough times, it sort of becomes an if then. Mm -hmm. How do you mitigate that? I would say that you don't want to be giving that many rewards in the first place. The, as you said, giving a whole bunch of now then rewards kind of becomes an if then, it's depending on what you're tracking. So the goal is first keep them random. Don't constantly give out now that rewards for the same thing all the time. And then if you've given them, like once you've given them randomly, or that would be the first step, think about trying to get rid of those entirely. Or alternately, keep those for Truly extraordinary efforts would be my other answer now. I don't know if that's different from the last time I answered. Okay. <laughs> Any other, anything else? All right, thank you.